Before this video starts, I want to give a special shout out to one of my friends, Kira Animations on X, for drawing the thumbnail for me. Kira Animations is a talented artist I found on X, and there will be a link in the description if you'd like to go buy commissions from her. It's very affordable and easy to purchase. Minted. The Nintendo GameCube, a staple console in Nintendo's line of hardware, it marked a great ascent from polygonal models to a beautiful near HD visuals. The GameCube pushed the boundaries of gaming with a tire processor speed, increased memory capabilities, and innovative game design. It introduced a range of iconic games that took full advantage of their capabilities, offering richer textures, more complex environments, and smoother gameplay. I remember my fun with the GameCube. I didn't even own one, I had a cousin who owned one, and every time I go to her house to play Mario Kart, I loved it. Going to Daisy Cruiser, getting shot out of the cannon pipe of the cruiser ship, so much fun. But unfortunately, as it's fun to reminisce on the good old days of the GameCube, it ultimately did not sell well, compared to the PlayStation 2. But nevertheless, I always have this saying, quality over quantity. And when it comes to the GameCube, it had a lot of quality games. With games like Star Fox Adventure and Metroid Prime pushing the game's capabilities, it ultimately proved that Nintendo wasn't just for kids. It could be joined by a vast audience, and truly, they they were works of art. And in works of art, there are generally heroes and there are villains. And in today on Rubio, we'll be talking about the vile villains of the GameCube era. As kids, we never really knew how villainous these villains were. But as adults, we now realize how sick and twisted they are. And sometimes outright psycho and crazy. So without further ado, here's my top picks on the five scariest GameCube villains. King Boo, Luigi's Mansion. We start off our list with the launch title of the GameCube, Luigi's Mansion. It's usual for Nintendo to release their newest console with the Mario game to start it off with, but they took it differently by making Luigi the main character this time. Luigi wins a mansion he in a contest he never even entered and visits a mansion looking for Mario, who had gone there earlier. Luigi's Mansion follows a different formula from most Mario games, but it uses some enemies and characters from the Mario games as well. Despite that, this is actually the first canonical appearance of the King Boo, the main antagonist of the game. King Boo is self-explanatory. He's the King of Boos a species of ghosts that hide in ghost house and sometimes castle levels. King Boo first appears in Area 2 where Luigi makes the grave mistake of pushing a button, revealing King Boo and 50 other Boos. King Boo seems to recognize Mario and Luigi, and even tells Luigi, we're gonna do to you what we did to your brother, only worse. You could actually encounter King Boo prior to getting all the ghosts in the mansion before the final battle. If you have less than the required Boos and you need to open the door, King Boo will come out and mistake Luigi for Mario. Luigi then asks if he could give up Mario only for him to say, I will not give up my favorite decoration. I like Mario just where he is, implying he sees Mario as an object, but it gets even scarier after that. At the end of the game, we reach King Boo's secret altar. King Boo stares at his Mario painting, mocking him for pleading for help, saying he finds it satisfying, highlighting his deep sadism. But he reveals that he has had many run-ins with Mario before, as he said, I remember all the trouble you caused me in the past. After a while, King Boo then teleports Luigi in a Bowser painting and fights using a controlled Bowser. Bowser is implied to be dead, or at least, not in the sense that that's the real Bowser. So it makes it seem as though King Boo is just playing at Luigi's fears. King Boo is not only sadistic and cruel, but also a malevolent ruler whose contempt for two people surely scare the hell out of kids who pick up the game at launch. Very scary. Zant from The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess. Our next entry includes a self-proclaimed king, rather than a genuine king, Zant. Zant is what appears to be the main antagonist of The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, for some time. He is a very tall and very intimidating individual from the Twilight Realm, an opposite world of Hyrule. He served for the Twilight Royal Family and wanted to be the next ruler of the Twilight Realm, but was rejected for being too crazy and too much of a psychopath along with his values being that of old age when in the Twilight Realm everyone has moved forward. Upset with the decision that they made, Zant went on a tantrum. And that is where he encountered Ganondorf, who manipulated his feelings to get back into the light world. What makes Zant so different from the other antagonists is how he's ruthless and cunning. He leeches a full frontal attack on Hyrule Castle and he gives Zelda an ultimatum. Surrender or die. Life or death. But ultimately, 
his treatment of Minna is downright cruel and realistic in a sense. After Link defeats the Lakebed Temple boss, Xant is seen waiting for him. He gives off the tall and scary impression that he's not a man to be messed with. He then turns the area into twilight and confronts Minna. He then proceeds to mock her for rebelling against him. But if that wasn't weird enough, what he does next takes the cake. He tries to manipulate Minna into joining his side, calling her my Minna and saying, I need you. It's pretty weird in itself. He's not treating her as a person. He treats her as like she's his ex-girlfriend and he wants her back. This becomes true later on when we see Midna pre-imp form. Xant is coming towards her and she's moving backwards. He looks like he's about to physically assault her, which he does. Apart from one other Zelda villain who I'll get to later, no other Zelda villain has this been realistically scary. Other Zelda villains just want power or greed, but Xant? He's just crazy. Black Doom, Shadow the Hedgehog. Alright, now I know this might garner some confusion because Shadow the Hedgehog was technically released on other consoles, but bear with me in mind. The GameCube version of Shadow the Hedgehog is objectively the better version because the other versions, PS2 and Xbox, were faulty to an extent. And besides, the thing was GameCube. I didn't say it had to be only GameCube, so yeah, let me do my thing. But back to the main topic at hand. Black Doom is the, no surprise, main antagonist of Shadow the Hedgehog. I mean, did you really expect him not to be the main antagonist? His name is Black Doom, and not only that, but he instructs his minions to go destroy cities. But here's a brief introduction to Black Doom. Black Doom is described to be the leader of the Black Arms, which he founded like 2000 years ago, but unfortunately, that ain't even the half of it. Black Doom first shows up as someone who can explain Shadow's past for him, as he had lost his memory back in Sonic Heroes. Black Doom manipulates Shadow's desire to uncover who he really is. He makes him kill innocent gun soldiers, blow up cities, and even assassinate the president. All of this justified because he hates humans. Even his treatment of Shadow is downright creepy. In the last story, if you do everything Black Doom tells you to do, he leaves you off and doesn't care for you anymore, as he tries to destroy the Earth. It's like he's your dad, who comes back after you not seeing him for a long time, and he tries to manipulate you in order to, like, get closer with him, only for him to leave you at the end. Shadow the Hedgehog might be a questionable game in existence, but Black Doom? He's anything but questionable. He's downright scary. Ganondorf, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker in every video game, a hero always has his villains. Mario will always have Bowser, Sonic will always have Dr. Eggman, and Link will always have any variation of Ganondorf. Well, not always Ganondorf, sometimes just Ganon, but you get my drift. Usually in a Zelda game, Ganon slash Ganondorf is always a serious threat to Hyrule, but he takes it a step further in Wind Waker. Despite the game's colorful graphics, weird looking characters, funny dialogue, and funny expressions, this game has Ganondorf at his seriously unhinged face. For those of you who don't know, this Ganondorf is the same Ganondorf from Ocarina of Time. At the end of Ocarina of Time, he is defeated by Link and sentenced to the Sealed Realm, where he is there for a long time, but the seal breaks off one day. The seal was eventually broken and Ganondorf returned. Ganondorf, now more cunning and driven by his desire for power, took advantage of the weakened state of Hyrule. In response to his return, the gods of Hyrule had flooded the land. It's later revealed that Ganondorf killed the sages so that a new hero couldn't come and kill him. Because Ganondorf still had the Triforce of Power and Zelda's descendant has the Triforce of Wisdom. So there'd be someone new for the Triforce of Courage. Knowing that Zelda needs to have a descendant to have the Triforce of Courage, Ganondorf sends the Helmer Rock King to kidnap blonde girls with pointy ears. Eventually, Ganondorf comes close to killing Link had it not been for Tetra, and that is where he discovered that Tetra is Zelda's descendant and finds the Triforce of Wisdom. He then attempts to kill both Link and Tetra and take the Triforce of Wisdom from Tetra, but is stopped by Medley and Komali. Towards the end, we're greeted with Ganondorf lamenting how he couldn't help his people and that he lived in a vast desert where death was certain. He's playing with Link's emotions, trying to get him to feel bad for him, which turns out to be a ruse as he attacks Link. With Link and Zelda out of commission, Ganondorf turns to the Triforce and wishes that the land of Hyrule come back to its old ways. But he is stopped by King Daphne's Nohansen Hyrule, who wishes that they flood the land moving on with their lives. With his plan botched and his entire operations all for nothing, Ganondorf unleashes it to a rage. 
and it's a fight to the death with Link and Ganondorf, with Link ultimately killing Ganondorf. Ganondorf in this game dwells in the past. He dangerously holds on to it because it's the only thing he knows. In Wind Waker, Ganondorf just kills anyone who comes in his way. A far cry from his you're a worthy opponent attitude in Ocarina of Time. Doesn't even matter that they're children, he'll kill anybody, and that's what makes him scary. Gerald Robotnik, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Our final entry is not technically a GameCube original per se. It was originally released on the Dreamcast about a year earlier. However, it was ported to the GameCube, and the GameCube version is seen as the better version, so yeah, we're gonna include it. Sonic Adventure 2 is Sonic's magnum opus, his best work so far. It's also where things start to get really serious. I mean, Eggman blew up the moon for God's sake. I mean, just look at it. Yeah, E for everybody, my ass. But despite all these fun things and occasionally dark things, the thing that takes this as the darkest Sonic game has to be Gerald Robotnik. Gerald Robotnik is Dr. Eggman's grandfather, who he describes as the world's greatest scientist. Gerald Robotnik created Shadow the Hedgehog to be the ultimate life form, to help his sick granddaughter, Maria Robotnik. Gerald Robotnik worked on the Space Colony arc where they developed weapons of mass destruction and other uses such as the Eclipse Cannon. However, one day Gun shuts down the project as they feared what Shadow the Hedgehog could become. So they kill everyone on board, including Gerald's granddaughter Maria. This sent Gerald down in a dark spiral where he became crazy and decided to get revenge. Just listen to his monologue here. This is a death sentence for every human being on Earth. If my calculations are correct, the Space Colony Arc will impact the Earth in 27 minutes and 53 seconds. All of you will be destroyed, along with your beloved planet Earth. I plan to give you a taste of my revenge once all the seven Chaos Emeralds are collected. Once I initiate this program, it cannot be disabled. All of you ungrateful humans who took everything away from me will feel my loss and despair. Is there anything else you want to say? No. Re yeah, if there's anything to describe Joe Robotnik, it would be that he's a massive psycho. On one hand, you can feel sympathetic for him because he did lose his granddaughter, but that sympathy kind of goes away once you realize he wants to kill the entire human race. For what some people do, and no longer do anymore. Granted, this plot was foiled by the heroes. However, just think about it this way. We could all be in the way of dying because of somebody's grudge against humanity, even though humanity didn't kill his granddaughter. It was just an agency. And just imagine how he was executed. Pure fucking dark. The GameCube at launch was not as success as Nintendo wanted it to be. With his competitors PlayStation 2 having DVD features and Xbox having Wi-Fi capabilities, the GameCube was crushed majorly by the PS2 and marginally by the Xbox. But that shouldn't stop it from being remembered as a great console for Nintendo. It has some features I'm hoping we could bring back, such as the ability to play handheld games on the TV. Not to mention the 30 plus games that were included with it, some of which got a T rating for the first time in the series. And that means something that Nintendo has moved forward with their kitty image, that their IPs that were seen as friendly and available to everybody, that video games are not just for kids, but they're a form of media that should be widely appreciated, and a message that change is good. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit that like button and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And if you want to see more of these videos, please comment down what you'd like to see on the future. I'm Rubio. Peace out, everybody.